Step three, putting it all together. Rod, so let's put all of these things that we learned in this module into some context. All right, but before we do that, let's say this is the last video of this entire module. It's not mm. the last step. There are a couple of other things after this, but we should thank everybody who's helped us put all of this together. So we should thank you know, Husni, and we should thank the editors, uh, Matsuzawa-san and Yasui-san, and we should thank all of the students who have done oh, all, yeah. of, all of the work on all of this. Without you guys, it wouldn't have happened, right? Okay? Thank you very, very much. So what else? Let's see. So just to go all the way back to the core idea here, there are four things that a repeater has to do, and then once you have repeaters, you can build a network out of them, right? So the first thing... Well, establish entanglement between two neighboring nodes. So link-level entanglement. Good. That Next. involves handling loss of photons, right? Oh, yeah. Second thing... We extend this from neighboring nodes to nodes which are separated by larger distance by multiple hops. So we uh, establish end-to-end -end entanglement. The primary mechanism we used for doing that was um, entanglement swapping. That's right. Then we have to think about how do we handle state and operation errors. So we saw a few examples which we used in our calculations of unitary errors, but there's also other types of errors. And the main uh, protocol that we used was the purification. All right, and then the last thing. And the last thing, we have to think more uh, in terms of the networking and how to handle things like routing, uh, how to handle things like multiplexing when there's uh, contention for resources, and how to manage all of these thing, things, including security. So that's things like the routing protocol you know, that we talked about and the multi-level system in the internet and things like that in this, in, earlier in this lesson, but also a lot of that back in lesson mm. 12, I think. Possibly. Right? All right, so all of those are technical requirements for how you go about building boxes and an internet, but the people who are taking this module, they're people. They're people. Right? And so people are the ones who design and build and operate these networks. So this is the first module in what will be a pretty extensive and pretty in-depth sequence on quantum communications and quantum computation, you can choose sort of your specialty within that area. But primarily here, we're focusing on the quantum communications. And there are going to be a whole lot of jobs that are, that are possible, a whole lot of career paths for you to go forward with this as you complete this entire set of modules and complete a degree or just even for your own purposes. So, so what are these specializations? Well, I'm an architect, mm -hmm. so I listed architecture first. Um, that involves defining the subsystems within a larger system and defining the relationships. So you define block A and block B and what's the relationship between the two? What's the contractual agreement between them? What messages do they exchange? Mm -hmm. What uh, behavior are, are expected of the different subsystems? And with all of that, that allows you to make forward progress by dividing the prob a large problem into a set of smaller problems and then each of those can be worked on to a certain extent independently. Protocols. So the protocols define the messages that get exchanged on the wire and the behavior, what you do when you get a message, but also what you do when you don't get a message and sort of other sets of rules you have to follow, what sort of promises you make mm -hmm. as participating in, in, in a particular network communication, for example. Um, as we saw just recently, we talked about standardization, right? Mm -hmm. Hardware. Oh, hardware is very important. That's closer to my heart as a <laughs> physicist. But uh, hardware are the physical things that basically allow all of these more abstract things such as uh, architecture and protocols uh, to work. So we need to design the hardware, we need to analyze it, we have to ensure that really our boxes, our quantum boxes, our memories that are sitting at quantum nodes, they are distributing entanglement. If something goes wrong, uh, what do we do? And uh, uh, how do we test things? And how do we build them? Yeah, so all of that, I mean, everything we're talking about here is all super critical. You have to have all of these things in order to build a network. But fundamentally, if the hardware doesn't work, we're just toast right off the yeah, bat, right? Yeah. So, all right, software. You got to have software too, right? And that some of that is software that's internal to the boxes you're building. Mm -hmm. And so nobody cares if you change that 
Mm -hmm. As long as they, you know, what they care about is the external behavior mm -hmm. of the box. But software also includes implementation of those protocols that we talked about earlier. Right. And that building hardware is hard, right? Yeah. Building software, people think is easy, but that it doesn't happen automatically. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's also the case that software can be iterated more quickly than hardware can. Mm. You can make small changes to things in, in, in software mm. and redeploy hardware, uh, redeploy software fairly quickly. But where software meets protocols, once the protocols are defined, mm. it starts to get to be a lot harder to change. Mm -hmm. And even that software that you're actually iterating quickly, even getting that right also takes a, lo a lot of mm. work. And so, you have to have the right balance between hardware and software, although it often seems like it's easier to get software up and running quickly and easily, building a complete and robust system that does everything that's expected and nothing it's not expected to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's all hard work too. Right. We also have to have operations and management of the networks. So once all of these boxes are built, you know, we talked about the routing protocols and we talked about all these other things, somebody's job is going to be to order boxes from the companies that provide this stuff mm -hmm. and bring them into your building and unbox them and set them up and turn them on and run them and make sure that they connect to, to the local systems and that everything works and that, that keep track of what's working and what's not. All of that's mm -hmm. operations and maintenance and that's an important career path in, in, mm -hmm. in the classical internet as well. Well, um, next one is education and community. Exactly what we're doing now. We are educating <laughs> people. And we're participating in the community. Yes, so we're both researchers and educators, um, but this applies not only at the university level where we are right now, but it also includes high school and, and also post-secondary education. So it can be educating the public as well as educating people with, within a uh, formal school context. Um, so all that's really important. So mm. some of you could wind up as high school teachers and that's a perfectly fine career path for, for going forward because I'm certain that there are going to be quantum classes in high schools in the future. And somebody's got to be uh, trained train the people yep. who teach those. Yep. One other aspect in this is where we included a community is there's also a lot of discussion mm -hmm. these days about the ethics of artificial intelligence or AI. There is just beginning to be a conversation about the ethics of, of quantum as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also relationships with how all of this is going to fit into society and legal things as well, because mm -hmm. In particular, quantum networks and quantum computers both have a significant impact on mm. cryptography, which is considered to be a sensitive issue. Mm. It seems like a very disruptive technology. Anything quantum, whether it's communication or computation, oh yeah. Yeah, and so businesses and governments both care, care about this and how it's going to affect uh, their, their own operations as well as their own mm. societies. And then theory, that would be you, wouldn't that it? That would be me, yes. <laughs> There's always theories needed, particularly when it comes to quantum computation and quantum technologies. Uh, the, the things that are may, quite important are information theory. So uh, the, the formal mathematical theory of how to process information, how to distribute information, uh, how to communicate information. Uh, these, are, these are all included under, under the theory. And it doesn't need to be quantum. It can be also classical, uh, but quantum is the, the more fun one, more more surprising one. And the design of new algorithms, of course. <laughs> we, we always want to know how to do things better or how to do things which we haven't thought of. And quantum is the perfect playground for that. There, there's a, a truly a large opportunity for uh, creativity to kind of like uh, uh, let it run free and, and see what uh, amazing new algorithms and applications we can, we can come up with. So all of this, um, you know, there's, it's a fantastic and exciting time to be in quantum, whether it's quantum networking or quantum co communication. Um, I've been doing this since 2003. Prior to that, I was doing primarily classical systems. And you know, every year it gets to be more and more, more and more exciting and more and more real. Particularly with the recent developments uh, in by IBM and mm. Google and uh, other new startup companies like INQ, INQ SciQuantum. Yeah. It's a truly, truly mesmerizing time <laughs> to be in quantum, whether it's computation or communication. And now's a great time for you all to be quantum natives and to come to come join join all of us in the process of this. So thank you all for participating in this module and we'll, we'll see you again. See you. Bye.